Hello, 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 and welcome to Dialogue with Janae. I'm so excited to have you here joining us this evening. We have a very special show planned for you today. Um, it's one that I hope will inspire you, especially our moms tuning in um, and those aspiring to be moms because uh, being a mom is one of the toughest jobs one would ever have. And it's one that you truly do not get a financial reward for, but it's one that you get a reward that you cannot put a value on. And so as a mother that on my journey, you know, I've experienced a bunch of highs and lows. And sometimes you can feel like you're the only one, you know, going through it. Or sometimes you can feel like, you know, am I not being a good mother? Am I not doing, you know, the right thing? Did I not read the manual that I did not receive, you know, and, you know, doing this job the right way? But I want you to know that the thoughts that you have that go through your mind are not thoughts that are specifically for you all mothers go through it. Our mothers have went through it. Our grandmothers have gone through it. And unfortunately, our children, you know, will go through it as well. And so it's, um, I'm, I'm happy to share with you some women who God has placed in my life um, through different aspects uh, along my journey um, of this thing called life that have really touched my heart um, in ways that I didn't expect. And if we are blessed to meet people along our life's path that can inspire us um, and encourage us to be better and to do better, then that is something worth sharing. That is something worth remembering. And that is something worth holding close to your heart so that when you do come upon those times when you feel like, yeah, I'm not cut out for this job or, um, yeah, you know, I thought I was going to be good at this, but perhaps I'm not. Or, whoa, you know, they didn't tell me all this was coming, you know, along with this package. It's good to have people that you can draw upon their strength draw upon their examples, draw upon their story to help encourage you and inspire you to keep on pushing to your greatest. So welcome. Let Allow me to introduce my first guest. I have a fellow stay-at-home mom. For those who may not know, um, I left the workforce, I believe, I can't remember Back in 2000, I don't know, let's say 18, maybe, no, 2000, 18, 2007, I left the workforce. I was in um, professional sports working as a certified athletic trainer with the WNBA team and also in medical device sales, assisting um, surgeons, uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, during surgery, as well as providing services to internists and podiatrists as well and so for all my stay-at-home moms out there it is not an easy job you know to me it's the hardest job ever and so i would like to welcome to my dialogue miss jamel mcnally hello jamel hello um it's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. And hello to everyone who's going to see this. I um, hope you gain some great information from it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, Jamel, share with some of our guests, how many kids do you have or you have been blessed to nurture into productive citizens? <laughs> I am raising five future productive citizens and uh, they're all boys. And um, so, yeah, I have a full house over here. 
Oh, wow. Five. And you know, we always go through this. I keep wanting to um, only give you four kids. But because, <laughs> because Jamel was blessed to have a set of twins. Yes. 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 So she actually, so you actually had four births, right? Yeah. Well, really three. It's still five births because you got to push them out. You know, regardless if you come as twins, you still got to push them out. <laughs> well, yeah. I, was, I was one of the people who had them removed, but because <laughs> my body doesn't do that, but we heard them here. So that counts. And yeah, there's five of them, um, ages 10, 8, 6. The twins are 6, so 6 and 6. And then uh, a soon-to-be 4-year-old on June 2nd, he will turn 4. Right. Our oh, congratulations and upcoming birthday. How exciting. Yes. Um, something that we moms we look forward to doing, celebrating because all the stuff we went through to get them here on earth is a party every year. <laughs> yes. Birthdays are blessings. Yes, they are. They are. Yes. Now, um, how long have you been married? 11 years. Oh, 11 years. And... Yeah. Allow me to thank you for your service, for you, for all that, you know, who may not know. Um, your husband is in the service, correct? Yes, he is. He is a uh, former active duty and a reservist now. But um, yes, he is a West Pointer, so he has lived it a long time. He has uh, been serving the country a long time. So I will definitely pass your thanks on to him uh, for yes. all and all our other service members do. Yes, yes, ma'am. And a lot of people, they take for granted what you as the wife um, and, and other wives go through because mm -hmm. you are truly a mom boss in that sense alone, you know, mm -hmm. having to, in essence, you know, be a single parent, you know, when your husband is away, you know, serving and helping to keep us protected. So I do, when I say thank you for your <laughs> service, I, I truly mean that. And that's for all of the spouses, you know, because we have women who are serving too, where the men stay at home on the home front and keep that safe, you know. So I do commend all spouses, you know, who, who have to stay behind you know, and keep the family going and keep the family afloat because that's not an easy task. Um, so thank you for that. Um, now, how, so how long have you been a stay-at-home mom? I was a stay-at-home mom um, right after I got married, essentially. So um, 10 years, like when I found out I was, you know, pregnant with the first one. And at that time, we had moved uh, because of the military. So um, when we moved and I was pregnant or whatever, then that kind of started my stay-at-home mom career because um, I did not go back in the classroom then. Um, previously teacher and I... Um, started just mommying and teaching my own kids <laughs> once they rolling in. Right, right, right. Now, prior to um, becoming a stay-at-home mom, and I guess before getting married, what was your profession then? So, yeah, I was a classroom teacher, an elementary school teacher. Um, I taught special education for a few years, um, K-5, and then I went back to regular education in, or, you know, I, I don't, I guess, I don't know if regular is the term they use now. That's what we used to call it. But um, classroom education in third grade for third graders. And so I always liked little kids. And then I had a bunch of my own. Right. And so now you have your own little classroom at home that you do on the weekends and on breaks and yeah. when they come home from school because you got to get the homework done, right? Yes, yes, yes. And yeah, then so special in that regard because of the pandemic, you know, I think a lot of parents, <laughs> whether they had an education background or not, they um, have had to jump closer to your lane. Uh, you, you're a homeschooler, uh, you know, you've been doing it and you're really great at it, but I think a lot of parents have had to, you know, learn some tips from the homeschooling parents and try to figure out how to have public school, you know, regular school at home. So we have been schooling at home rather than being homeschoolers. 
Right, right, exactly. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I remember when, when we first started with the pandemic, you know, it really wasn't that big of a deal for us because, you know, that's what we yeah. do. We stay at home. You know, we at home all day, every day. And mm -hmm. I was hearing the woes and all of that from, you know, my friends and, you know, family, you know, trying to see, like, you know, but, you know, like, this is a lot. And I was just sitting there, like, you know, I couldn't understand, right? Yeah. And then like, it hit me. It hit me. I'm like, wait a minute, Shanae. Go back to the very beginning, the beginning. very beginning, where you were about to lose your mind. Like, I'm in this house all day, every day, Monday through Friday, you know, teaching, mama, cooking, shelf, um, PE coach, everything, right? And it's yeah. like, and, you know, back then I wasn't working. You know, now I'm working, you know, right. but back then you know and it's like trying to multitask that but that just goes to show you we as humans we are very adaptable you know yeah. in the in the beginning of course yes anything is hard for us to manage in the beginning but yeah. god has equipped us with a spirit of i don't know what would you call it but just you know resilient, resilient. resilient. yes 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 and if you allow yourself to there isn't anything that you can't do, you know, if you just push through and don't, don't, don't look at, you know, just if you maintain what's in front of you and don't Absolutely. look at the entire picture. Yeah. I think that was a big lesson that I learned and I was fortunate to know a lot of homeschoolers. So I had friends that were homeschoolers and I kind of picked up some tips from them in terms of it doesn't have to look like uh, what anyone else's, you know, version looks like. That's the main thing I learned from my friends and family that were homeschoolers was, you know, you're free the moment you stop comparing um, your circumstances or your the way you guys are doing it to what someone else can do with their children because all families have different needs. And so even though we were still tied to the curriculum of the public school that our children are in, and so homeschoolers have a, a different freedom of setting their curriculum, the timing and the flow of it according to the needs of their family. And I think some of the challenges that people were having that were still navigating work and the virtual schooling was they didn't have that flexibility. But at the same time, they also hadn't learned, like a lot of homeschool parents had learned, to not compare themselves, to right. not expect the same results that other families were getting at the time they were getting it and to get into their own rhythm and their own flow. And I think that was key to being able to survive the situation and thrive in the situation. Right, right, right. Yes, yes, you bring up a valid point. Sometimes we get caught up in life comparing ourselves to the Joneses, as they would yeah. say. Um, and we, even though we hear it all the time, we it, it's just something in us you know when you look to your left or look to your right and you're like well hey you know how come they and how come they and why not me you know yeah. but we have to remind ourselves like you said you know our walk is our walk you know mm -hmm. and we can look to other people for encouragement and yeah. all of that but we need to continue to know that what god has for us is for us and yeah. give ourselves grace you know, we need, you know, and be okay with that. Be okay with that. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you this. As, in, as a stay-at-home mom, there are a lot of things that we come against. Mm -hmm. um, what obstacles along your mom journey have you had to face that have molded you into, into the person you are today? Mm, I think one of the major things... Um, I had to, you know, we already talked about like kind of running your own race and not expecting your life to look like anyone else's. Um, that was a big one. And then isolation. I think a lot of stay at home moms deal with being lonely or feeling like they don't quite have the same experiences to um, relate to others in social settings and things of that nature. And so I think I had to just find uh, my identity as a mom. And, you know, because it's different than who you were when you were single and, you know, you, you have those friendships. So just kind of finding the people that you have commonalities with, finding your way, your pace, being comfortable with that. 
And then, you know, um, finding ways to still have camaraderie with others outside of the home, even though your primary, everything that you do, your, your work and your relaxation is still at home with your kids, you know? Right, right, right. Yes. Um, when, when, when you say trying to find your commonalities, you know, with other people, what um i know so, sometimes they stay at home moms especially when we're coming from the professional setting and mm -hmm. now we're having to 100 percent depend on our spouse's income and we're no longer bringing in that income sometimes that can be a hard pill to swallow yeah. not you know you know not because you know you know we're trying to be this independent we don't need to right. take care of us not that but just the fact of you feel like okay i went to school i got all this education right. and now i'm at home you know um yeah you just sometimes feel like wow really is this is this where it is but yeah i would not trade it for nothing in the world oh, especially here. given you know my story with my daughter being in heaven now yeah. i had seven years you know with her every yeah. day all day i was mommy care daycare school teacher everything you know so that was a blessing you know Absolutely. and i wouldn't trade that for for anything in the world but it's still there still comes a time you know when you feel like wow you like know, all this you know intelligence i can do this i can do that you know right. um and i know for me i tried to find avenues to still keep me in that world you know but still not take away from my primary responsibility and that's being a primary caregiver of my children so Absolutely. how did you how did you um find that, that balance need? yeah so i i mean yeah you have those things where you're like i'm a smart you know i i could do a lot of things or whatever and now i'm arguing with a three-year-old and you know <laughs> picking up Cheerios all over the place, you know? So you definitely have those moments where you're like, what is happening here? <laughs> like, I should be doing more. But just like you, I did not want to give that time up. And that, you know, um, with my husband having such a huge, you know, kind of busy schedule and a lot of stuff going on with his career, because he has, of course, another career life in addition to the military. Um, I needed to be the person that was the available parent. And, and I was fine with that. And I enjoyed that. Um, but I did need another avenue. And I guess, you know, that's kind of where our common <laughs> business comes in was because that was one of the ways that I was able to have my own thing at such a highly flexible level that it allowed me to still be fully immersed in being a stay-at-home mom. Right, right, right. And um, just for those who don't know, the common business that she's um, referring to is Beauty Counter. And so yes. you have found the, which, you know, Beauty Counter is um, a new brand that's been out, you know, for a minute, but it's more than a, um, a beauty company. It's a movement towards a cleaner, healthier uh, lifestyles, you know, Absolutely. making sure that yeah, yeah. It's a lifestyle. And I think that's the difference with Beauty Counter. It's not just, you know, things in a box that we sell. It's it's not just, oh, we use this product because we sell it. It's it's really, we use the product because we believe in it. And then we sell it because we want to educate others about why it's important. Like why the mission behind the company is important. Um, and so we sell it as a solution to other people. We, we sell it as a way to simplify the search for other people. Um, and what has been great about Beauty Counter is not only did it give me an opportunity to, you know, have my own business, but the community, because like-minded people have come to Beauty Counter. People that um, were on the same search for safer products and health solutions and wanted to, you know, better the world in terms of sustainability, and wanted to, you know, and cared about equity in terms of fairness of how products are created and who is able to get healthy products, where they're available. People with all of those ideals gravitated towards the beauty counter community. And so even as the company has grown, it still feels very familial. It's still, you know, you still have a ton of support within the organization that feels like friends. It feels like, 
oh, oh my gosh, let me reach out to them and ask them about whatever, you know, like, do you guys know how I can recycle this kind of thing? Or do you guys know about a hair product that will, you know, that doesn't, that has safer ingredients or all of that stuff. And so it is given not only an opportunity, but also a community. Right, right. And and especially as a stay at home mom, we need all the community. Yes, we, can get. we can get so isolating. I mean, you know, three year olds are amazing, but <laughs> you know, as conversationalists and you know, it, it can be a struggle, you know. Right, so, right, right. So the community um outside of the home is super important for moms as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I know that's why I, I, I found whatever homeschool group I can get, I could get to, whatever mom's club I could get to. And I'm I'm very thankful um for those um people who were there for me, you know, who supported me and who still support me even to this day now. So mm -hmm. um speaking of having a support group. Um, can you stick around? Um, yep. I would like to be able to bring you back uh, later on. Is that good? Absolutely. Thanks okay. so much. All okay. right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So I'm going to bring on a next um, mom who this lady here. I mean, it's all, you know, this saying how I don't, I don't want to use the term, you know how they say, you know, well, if, if you think you got it bad, look at somebody else, right? It's not that, it's not that type of party, but you never know what people are going through unless you have walked through their shoes. And you all know my story as far as um, my prematurity, you know, dealing with my premature birth with Jayla and then having her uh, with my son's food allergies and then you know, having Jayla be diagnosed with a pediatric brain, you know, brain tumor. And it's like, until you have walked in someone's shoes, you will never understand what they have gone through. And I, my next guest is a mom who is truly an inspiration to many. Um, and because not only of her personal story, but how she is using her personal story to help others. And so allow me to introduce you to Miss Erica. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I am doing well. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Janae. Super excited to be here tonight. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I am super excited to have you. Um, so, you know, you are clearly definitely a mom boss. Um, so please share with us how long you have been married and how many kids you have. <laughs> I have been married eight and a half years, coming up on nine in August. So, so grateful and thankful to have been in this journey for so long. I've been knowing my husband since college, um, so 15, 16 years now. And I'm a mom of one that feels like three, if I can be honest. Uh, she, a true living miracle baby and a real life doll baby. And I am so blessed to be her mom. Um, you know, before I became a mom, I actually never thought I would be a mom. And so I am just blessed. Uh, there is truly purpose for my pain and just excited that we, our lives, you and I were brought together and intertwined as a result of our own clean beauty journey. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, Erica, our connection is not only, um, she's also a fellow beauty counter um, consultant, um, but that is not our only connection. Our other connection is she's also a NICU warrior mom. Uh, blessed to have a NICU warrior baby princess. And so um, it, it is truly, truly a testament because anyone who has traveled the journey of the NICU life knows that you do not know what to expect from day to day. You know, I remember the doctors telling me, um, basically, we, we just waiting to see what's going to happen. You mm -hmm. know, Jayla has the worst part. Hope for right. the best, right? right. Exactly. Exactly. Like, yeah. Jayla has to do her part. You as the parents have to do your part and we as the doctors do our part and God does the rest. Yes. And I'm sitting there like, really? 
all that education you got as a doctor. And that's that's all we got. <laughs> I'm totally with you. That's that, that's all we can come up with, right? It's right. like time, patience, and timing. And you know, you and I both understand time and patience is like really hard when you're just wanting to hold your baby. There are times when you, you know, can't even hold your baby, and someone is telling you when you can hold them, when you can change them, when you can feed them, and that just is completely abnormal for the motherly instinct, and that literally like i i consider myself to be humble but it really humbled me in a different way and i can't say that i'm the most patient person but it really helped to enhance that skill set for me and really holding on to nothing but faith i mean the last 17 weeks of my pregnancy journey my husband and i were pre uh, preparing for my daughter's birthday and death day in the same day 17 weeks of just like, wow, like, you know, undiagnosed depression, undiagnosed anxiety. I was going to therapy, but I didn't realize like how much it had really, this experience had took over me until literally almost a year later. And that is just a lot. And so I know you and I aren't alone in this journey. And, and I love what you said earlier about our journey is our journeys. And for anyone that's out there that's like, oh my gosh, you know, my journey is ter terrible, but then you look at someone else and theirs is even worse, but it's still your experience. And don't negate that. And for friends who have friends that are in the NICU, and let's say you had a normal pregnancy and they didn't, but you're having, let's say, a tough time adjusting to mummyhood, don't think that your other friend don't want to hear things about you as well so don't immediately shut them out because you're assuming that oh my gosh they got it worse than me no that community matters and us being vulnerable together and talking about our unique experiences is what keeps us as a community right right exactly and also it keeps us in the know you yes. know it keeps us powerful because with knowledge comes power and that's one reason why i do these um episodes or shows because i learn from other people and exactly. i know before you know before i even had kids i had a friend who had her their child had food allergies and i learned from her i wasn't even i was married but we didn't have kids you know how yeah. she you know kept everything separate how she had to wash her hands how she had to you know use paper i had she had how she had to look at the ingredients you know cook things separate. i watched all of that right so then when my first exactly. born came and we thought that she had food allergies until we had the second child we like oh no she didn't have food allergies <laughs> but it was like oh I know what to do. Like this is not it's new to me, but it's not new because I exactly. saw and I witnessed and she shared and I knew. And so it is the same thing. Like you said, we have to be open and we have to, you know, be okay with sharing our information because we don't know how it will bless other people. Mm -hmm. And so um but, but before you became a mom, what what line of work were you in? Oh, God. So even before and after I became a mom, um, my life's work was in national security, um, working across um, the intel community. And that's what I did uh, most of my adult career. And um, through life, as we know it, and the lot of the change, I knew that I needed more flexibility. I needed the ability to be able to work from home and i call it COVID clarity and as a result of COVID clarity i actually made the leap in the midst of literally a pandemic and took a completely different career change that offered flexibility where i could work from home and not put my cardiac baby um in any more danger than she had to be with me having to go out every day and having two parents having to go out the house every day just to to work and so i made the switch into uh, tech policy and trust and safety. And it has been an incredible experience being able to use my national security strategic analysis, um, those skills to really bring a lot of things 
like to light and think of problem sets a different way. And honestly, my national security background, I used it as a new mom, the strategic analysis of having to, how do I strategize and have a strategic plan and ask the right questions for doctors and for the healthcare professionals as it related to my daughter and um, really thinking through situations and like what is going to be, you know, weighing the um, the pros and cons. And, and, you know, I call it operational risk versus rewards. And that is something that I will never take for granted and just incredibly grateful um, for that. So yeah, I stayed in my role. I was a leader after I had my baby. And that was tough. There were times where I was microaggressed because of my child's needs in the workplace. And I am just so incredibly blessed now. I am in a place where that is not even an issue. If I need to be off, I need to do something for my child or my family, that is who comes first or myself. I need to take a step back because I need some self-care and maintenance and that is okay too. And I think that for me, I am always of the mindset that what you are looking for, like what you want to have is what you what is your soul is in like grounding for life, it is out there. You, If it's not there, you can create it. And I think that that is so important as a mom, as we say the words, hashtag mom boss, hashtag, you know, S-A-H-M, whatever the term is, even if you are a stay at home mom, as we heard from our fellow sister, um, J uh, Jamel, whatever that life is that you want, like we shouldn't be mom bashing, like whatever your experience is. And I think that for me, I've learned so much and I've never been a person that's like drama filled anyway, but you really, when you've gone through the things that we've gone through, you have zero, zero right. time for drama, confusion, et cetera, because we know our babies and God bless your heavenly angel, um and your babies that are at home that we will never take that for granted their wow. every breath that they take every you know falling out that they've had and you know you're like oh my gosh you can't get through this and then you remember you weren't supposed to have that to begin with right. Right. so right exactly you girl you just said a mouthful because you know and then and, and that's one thing that kept me going because um Jay, you know, Jayla, my baby, who's my child, who's in heaven, her life was first threatened at, what, 14 weeks, you know, from Vays of Privia. My muscles were there and, you know, they said if she were to be born, she and I would die, right? Yep. And so then that resolved in 18 weeks, um, came back. It's, oh, you good. You don't have to worry about that anymore. It's like, yes. It was like, but now you have cervical funneling. <laughs> They're like, she's trying to come now. I'm like, really? You right. know, so we couldn't, we often had to do the surclage, you know, because um, it, it was too risky. You know, surclages, you have to do exactly. early on. Mm -hmm. So it was like, we're just going to bed rest. You know, came back in two weeks. They was like, oh, your body like that. So we're going to keep you flat on your back until you have your baby. Really? You know, so when she was diagnosed with cancer, we were like, oh, you know, clearly we can get through all of that. You know, because at 23 weeks, she ended up. Um, I had ended up going into the hospital because mm -hmm. nothing was holding her in but the membranes. And we know how to end those yes. now, right? Yes. So, and then at 27, we got an infection and here comes Jayla. You know, so it's like, we have to remember that we may not know why things happen, mm -hmm. but we know that we are prepared. And it's funny that you mentioned with your your work background the, the skills that you need to be successful in your job. You transfer those over to helping you be successful as a mom and as a as a uh, mom of a daughter whose life was at risk. You know, yes. for you to be able to strategic plan and make sure that she's receiving the best care possible. So we as moms, we have to be open. We have to be open to whatever life has for us and just know that we are equipped for this moment that we are in. Exactly. And, and I, exactly. And I know I get a lot of moms, I'll never forget after I had Nia and going back to work, 
you know, everyone that was like pregnant around the same time I was, we would share like the pumping room and like talking, they was, and, you know, they were talking about their, you know, normal pregnancies and typical things. And, you know, I shared a little bit about my journey and it was almost like, wow. And they're like, I don't know if I could do that. I'm like, honey, you don't raise your hand to be a part of the club. Like God chose you to be a part of the club. And quite frankly, you know, Nia was not expected to survive birth and we were actually recommended to terminate her not once but twice at 20 weeks at 22 weeks and no one thought she would actually survive birth I mean we had literally prepared for her funeral we have a memorial gown and she actually has a picture in what was supposed to be her memorial gown and so I think that as moms we should also remember even if you had a, a normal birth and you have friends that maybe have had something more difficult, that no one is choosing this journey. Like it happens and you just literally, you roll with it. Roll with it. You, you, you have no choice. Like if you're not going to do it, it's like, not, if not me, then who? Right. Right? Right. Like, and we're so heroic. Like moms are truly gladiators. Like, you know, somehow you become so equipped with what you need for your child, even the most introverted moms, I've seen them like fighting for their babies and they aren't quiet. Right. And that is how you know that we are genetically designed to do this thing called nurturing and caring. And it's truly a superpower. Right, right, exactly, it, exactly. And it's funny, I remember when we were on our um, fighting with Jayla on her cancer uh, brain tumor journey, my dad, you know, because we went through a lot with my son with his food allergies that I recognized as his mother, you know, uh, breastfeeding him at two months of age that, you know, something ain't right with this. And so and by the time we went and got him checked at six months, I had a list of things that he was allergic to just that I found just from him nursing from me, yep. um, breastfeeding. And my dad, I remember my dad telling me when we were dealing with Jayla, um, said, you know, if your kids had any other parents besides you and Dale, my husband, I don't think they would survive, you know, mm -hmm. because again it takes special parents and just like you use your background you know to help me uh when we had to make decisions about treatment plans and all this and that the knowledge that even though i wasn't in the workforce anymore using my educational background i used it then i we used it to look at the statistics to look at the risk to look at the benefits you know to look at the pros and cons to look at you know what 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 different treatments were promising not promising and all mm -hmm. of that stuff and um when it's time for us to step up we step up and yes, like you said, do. it's not by choice. <laughs> Clearly, it's not by choice. Exactly. You know, like we would say, you know, like guys, okay, I got a, I got a child who's going to have brain cancer. Which parent, which family wants it? Uh, exactly. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. We just do what we got to do. You know. So, moms who are going, who, who, if you're out there and you're dealing with a possible worst case scenario or a possible something that you hope that you would never have to deal with, just know that you can. Just yeah. know that you are equipped for this moment. Listen to um, Jamel, listen to Erica, listen to me. God has given you everything that you need to be able to do what you need to do for this very moment that you find yourself in. And um, we just want to encourage you to, to just believe in yourself Surround yourself with people who will encourage you and inspire you and motivate you and lift you up because there will come times when you get, you know, tired and weak, you know, and like, oh, I don't think I can do it. And then that's when you need a support system there. And that's one thing, like I said, you know, with Erica, you know, we're, we're, we're both beauty counter um, consultants and we're both. Nikki warrior moms, you know, we're both divine nine sisters, you know, I want to mention yes. AKA whatever, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but you know, we, 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 we are, we are, I don't know, when you find those people that have the 
that special ingredients. Those are the people that you want to hold near. And Amen. so that's why I've invited you and Jamel. And um, if you can stick around for me, yes. I, I want to be able to uh, bring you back on. Okay. Absolutely. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. But this is why I've invited these special women on with me tonight, because not only you know, are we uh, business partners within Beauty Counter, but we have so many commonalities, you know, between us. And the most important one is being a mom. And because it's not something that you're prepared for. You know, I, I, have, I have three kids now, three. And I, believe me when I say, and my youngest, well, before the third, when my youngest, uh, my son, okay, let's say my middle, my middle child will be 12 this year. And so my youngest uh, just turned five. And when we had her, me and my husband looked like, and so what, okay, now what are we supposed to do again? You know, like we were in the hospital with a baby, like, okay, so how, how, how does this work? Do, do we have everything? You know, it's like, I don't care how many times you do it. My, 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 my mommy in love who's in heaven, she had 10 kids. Man, I could not even fathom that, you know? And each one different personalities. I'm just saying, I just give it up for all mamas. I give it up. And so let me bring on my next mom. I'm so happy to introduce you. Um, she, she, for those who follow me, she is not a stranger to you. Um, I did have her on last in April. Uh, what, what, what month we in? In two months ago, in March, our Overcomer series. And so, welcome back, Miss Nicole McCann. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janae. You know, I always have a good time with you, so I appreciate you thinking of me and not getting tired of me <laughs> and inviting. No, ma'am. With you, so. I'm happy to yes, be. Yes, no, ma'am. I could never ever get tired of you, and that's you know because your 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 story, your walk, um, it's just so many different facets to it that it is 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 you know we can never get to all of it. First of all, and then second of all, it's just worth sharing because. You are so relatable to so many different people, you know, especially um, moms out there, women out there where becoming a mom is not easy for them. Um, and they have to really work hard at it and seek outside intervention, you know, in preparing you know, to become a mom and having the family that you that, that, that you so desire. So. With that being said, please share with everyone um, how long you've been married and how many kids you have. Okay. Um, so I have been married. It will be 15 years in July. Amen. That's a blessing. <laughs> that is a blessing. And, yes, July 22nd, we will celebrate 15 years. And we have four beautiful girls. I also have a set of twins. They were my first they are 11. They just turned 11 back on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. And then I have a eight-year-old who will be nine next month. I was about to say next week, almost next week, but next month. And my youngest just turned four in March. Very good. So you're like our um, our friend Jamel, fellow business partner Jamel, with minus one. She has five kids. Yes, a little, a minus <laughs> one. <laughs> yes. yes, people yes, always yes, trying to mess us up. They want to give I me know, five I girls know, just know. because she has no, five no, boys. No. <laughs> right, but you both have a set of twins, and I believe they were born around the same time. Is that correct? No, um, because my twins were first, and then her, but her, oh, yes. Son, I think was born. Uh oh, Jamel, don't get upset with me. I think he was born in September, so I think they're just four months apart. Okay, so, okay, yeah. all right. Um, now so tell, tell, give us a little um history about your back, your educational background. Okay, so keep it short and sweet. I went to Vanderbilt, go Vandy, VU. <laughs> um, for undergraduate and for my graduate studies, I went to the University of Kentucky and I got my master's in business administration, general management. 
Okay, very good. Smart lady. Um, I, me yeah. and I, we go back um, with, uh, as far as dancing, we grew up, she was, I was, I was just telling Dale, my husband, um, I don't know why you came up in my head, but I was like, oh, I just love that Nikki. She was such a cute little girl dancing oh. and had Nikki. Okay, so we're dancers, Nikki and I are dancers. So that's a commonality between us as well as we're sorority sisters. Uh, Aces, number one at that. Um, but anyway, Jamea, Erica is okay. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but so as dancers, um, anyway, it's beautiful when you have the extension, right? And when we, when you think about 180, you have a 360 degree circle, right? You split it in half, that's 180. So when a dancer can do a 180, that's like, what? Nelly, you know, and Nikki was doing 180s way back then, and I was just like, How can I be great? Oh, stop! <laughs> You're so sweet, yes, yes, yes. Now, I appreciate that, yes, ma'am. Now, um, what role do you play? I guess so like Jamel and I, you know, we were in the workforce and we came out of the workforce. Um, Erica was in the workforce, still working in the workforce. Um, and I believe she has had the opportunity to form two businesses um, working now. What has your um, career journey been? Oh, my career journey. Well, again, another simple, straightforward answer. When I came out of grad school, I went into finance with um, Cobb County government here in Metro Atlanta area and then moved from there. I only stayed with them for a few months and moved into consulting, which placed me at the CDC in order to work on financial projects as it related to terrorism because you know this was shortly after 9 11 back in 2001 i came in 2003 and so terrorism was a huge um concern for the cdc and so i dealt with budgets around the terrorism projects and then decided you know what this consulting life is kind of hard you know it's the long hours and in that time, I wasn't married or um, actually at the beginning, wasn't even dating anybody. But I knew that I had a goal to be married and have a family. And I was thinking long term, like, I don't know about this whole consulting thing. <laughs> you know, it was you have to go out and find clients, get business. It was the late long hours, um, long days then having to go and deal with the clients after work hours like taking them either to dinner you know because you're trying to get more work i was just like i want work-life balance so i decided to apply for just a full-time position with cdc which was easy for me since i had that in as a consultant and transitioned into the financial office there and have been doing budget ever ever since Right, right. It, yeah. that, that's funny how, you know, you were already planning for your family, you know, and thinking about your career. Um, cause that's one thing, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what would be more conducive, you know, for you to be the best mom, you know, best parent you can be. And that's one thing that I was thinking about too, you know, because as a certified athletic trainer, you know, we're there, you know, before the players come, while the players are there and after the players leave. And so, um, you know, I was like, okay, yeah, so I don't think I need to be running out on the field, you know, of my right. Entire career, right? And it's funny again how God, how things work, you know, kind of like what, what, what Erica was saying, you know, God has a specific, our journey is our journey, you know, and God, you don't ask for it, you know, it's laid out for us for whatever right. reason. And so, um, I ended up move, leaving, you know, the workforce because my child was born a preemie, you know, and then when I thought I was getting ready to go back, you know, to the workforce, I had my son and he had multiple severe life threatening, you know, allergies that I'm like, okay, oh, you can't really see him, you know, because I don't know if he'll come back to me, you know, right. um, because of his allergies, you know, so um, that's, that's 
kudos to you for even having, you know, the foresight, you know, to think like, okay, well, no, you know, this this isn't right for the family that I want to have, you know. And speaking of your family, um, share share with us um, the the journey in you becoming a mom. Yeah, so that was a very difficult journey, one that I thought wouldn't be difficult. You know, it was easy, right? I, you follow the plan, you date, you get married, you start a family. And so, of course, we did the dating thing. We decided, yep, we feel like we're right for each other. We got married. Let's spend some time traveling, enjoying each other, and then we're going to start our family. And when it came time for us to start that family, it wasn't so simple. Um, We actually didn't necessarily have a problem getting pregnant, but what we had a problem with, or I should say what I had a problem with because it was um, an issue that I dealt with. I had scarred fallopian tubes. And so it later turned out that I was getting pregnant, but the embryos were not able to get to my uterus to implant properly so that they could grow and be nourished and sustained for a pregnancy's duration. And um, it was, you know, we were excited, we got pregnant, and then we find out that it is an ectopic pregnancy and that, you know, they needed to terminate me because if not, it would threaten my life. And it was just, you know, no way for a baby to grow inside a little bitty fallopian tube. So they terminated us and that was a hard pill to swallow because of course, again, we had made the decision, we're ready to have our family. Um, And the doctor said, well, you know what? That's okay, it happens, we'll try again. Let's just see, you know, this might just be a one-time thing. And we tried again and like I said, got pregnant. Getting pregnant wasn't the problem. It was uh, yet again, another atopic pregnancy. But this time, this one didn't end um, as easily um, as the first one. And of course, emotionally, neither one was easy. But in terms of the actual tissue dissolving and, you know, whatever it does in your body, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. (laughs) Um, That didn't happen. In fact, the tissue, even after they gave me the medicine to terminate me, the embryonic tissue continued to grow. And as it grew... um, I later found out that it burst and I was in a lot of pain. Long story short, my husband, who was traveling for work at the time, happened to be in town and made (laughs) the decision, told me, look, I'm taking you to the hospital if you don't feel better in the morning. Did not feel better, but thankfully he had the mind to say, this isn't right. You were in too much pain. Let's go get you checked out. Um, cause had he not taken me, I would have hemorrhaged to death in the bed. So long story short, the doctor saved my life. Obviously I'm still here, saved my fallopian tubes and said, okay, you all will not, if you want to have this family of yours, you will not do it the traditional way. I'm going to send you to, um, an infertility specialist and you will need to get pregnant with assistance. And so we did, we went through IVF and um, barring the emotional journey and feeling like I was, you know, it was all my fault and it was because of me. We had to spend all this money just to even try to get pregnant. You know, it ended up being a true blessing. We, at the end of the day, received four embryos out of, I mean, they were able to extract like 14 eggs from what out of those 14, four were really viable, good quality embryos. And those four embryos are now my four beautiful girls that are walking the earth today. Right, right, right. So <laughs> your, your, your story is one of great tes- testament, one of great strength and one of great courage. And because all the things that you went through, you know, just to be able to try to have a baby and then to be told that if you do it, this is the way you have to go, knowing that is no guarantee based on science, you know, and you went forward with that, it's just a testament of knowing your faith and knowing what God placed in your heart. And so, like, because again, remember in the very in back when we go to the beginning, you as you were a consultant, and you were like, no, 
I can work for my family. So you already <laughs> said what was going to take place. Yep. We just didn't know how it was going to happen. And so we have to be encouraged as women and as moms. When God places a vision in your heart, when God places a desire in your heart, no matter what you may be seeing or looking at or experiencing, you have to hold on to that vision, hold on to that belief, hold on to that um, desire because it's real. Just right. as real as my name is Janae Davis. Well, I ain't gonna tell you about my whole name. But just as real <laughs> as my name is Janae Davis, it's real. And right. so speak to how you had to use your faith in the hardest of times. Wow, that that's a good question. Um, it definitely, I think, was an act of faith because even during that time, I know that I questioned if that was the right thing for us to do. And if we were um, like going around God to make something happen. And, you know, I know people subscribe to that, that school of thought, right? That if it wasn't meant to be, uh, or if it was meant to be, it would have happened. You wouldn't have had to go see a specialist. And I'm like, well, you know, when I thought about it, that doesn't make sense because, you know, everybody has some type of medical condition and problem. It's not because it's a punishment or you weren't meant to live a healthy life or a prosperous life, but that's why we have doctors, right? God has blessed people with the knowledge and the tools to help those of us who need help in whatever form or facet that may appear in. And for us, we needed fertility help. And so once I dealt with that and realized that no, because at the end of the day, like you said, it was no guarantee. I had to have faith that if it was meant for me to be a mom, if it was meant for us to have a family, that the IVF treatment would work. There's so many people who go through IVF and spend tons of money on several rounds of, in, um, of fertility treatments only to still not have a baby, you know, at the end of the process. And so we weren't blessed not only once, but two times, three times, four times. And even though the first time it was a blessing of two babies, because we were like, we're paying a lot of money for this. You go put two embryos back. I've lost two kids, not trying to have twins, but I need to know I have a good chance of one surviving. And so I just think going through the whole process and trusting and believing that we would get our babies, it was just a true act of faith and knowing that if it was meant to be, God would deliver on his promise, you know? So, and here we are, like I said, I just, my four beautiful baby girls who will always be my babies, even though they're 11, almost nine and four, they're going to be mama's babies. Right, right, right. Yes, ma'am. All day, every day. And on that note, I'm going to bring back Miss Jamel and Miss Erica to join us. Ladies, you all have shared a lot of information, you know, from your stories. And I hope that I hope that the guests looking on that they have been encouraged and been inspired by um, some of the information you all had to share. And like I mentioned, we're all Divine Nine Sisters. Um, Erica and Jamil, they are part of the, um, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let one of y'all say it. The, uh, we are ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Ready? Yes, we are. First and the finest, <laughs> ladies of pink and green. We could go on. <laughs> Look, green supreme, baby. Like, <laughs> All right, let me mute you. Let me mute you. No, I'm just <laughs> but we are a part of the Divine, Divine Mind Sisterhood, um, and that in itself speaks volumes of what 
we stand for, which is service and being able to help others. And that is what drew us to um, deciding to form our business, uh, bis our business's beauty counter. Um, I know for myself, uh, beauty counter is not my first business that I've had. I believe it's my third. Um, I formed my own sports medicine company, JDM Sports Medicine. Um, where I provided outreach services to high schools. Um, I also partnered with another uh, company, you know, where it was a service-based company where we help different charities um, with the proceeds that we make. And I know, Nikki, you, you've been, uh, you've had several different businesses that you've done, and Erica, you've had um, a couple as well. Uh, what what took you both down the entrepreneurial path? So for myself, um, my first um, entrepreneurial business was a, um, a professional editing consultant business, which was amazing. I love to write. I love to edit and review. I mean, it's funny how sometimes you look at your own stuff and like miss things, but like I'm so like about helping other people. So that former business was me helping other people with bios, resumes, et cetera. Anything that you could like write, I could edit it. And that was, I, I love it. I've always been a writer as a kid. I was in essay contests in elementary school, like winning those, like I, I just love to write. And so when I became a mom though, I needed, uh, I realized that I no longer as a leader in my full-time job and trying to do my small business, it took too much time away, focus away from what I needed within my home. And I needed something that was gonna be more automated, but yet still had purpose because I had been doing like consulting, um, editing consulting for a long time for free. And I, you know, as you get older, you start to get smarter and you like, there's still certain things I do pro bono, but you know, time is money and money is time. And if that time is being drawn from my, family, then it needs to matter. And I ultimately, as of last year, dissolved um, the business just because, again, I'm so busy. Um, as you guys see, like advocacy matters to me. And I had to really take a hard look at really what I was doing and where I was putting my time. And with Beauty Counter, it now allows me to have a business, be successful, um, spread a mission that's bigger than myself. Like for me, definitely isn't about selling beauty products because I mean, there's a dime a dozen come a company. But for me as a tech policy leader and someone that has lived her professional life around policy and implementation and how that affects the things that we do, that is where Beauty Counter had me. I was an avid consumer because of the clean beauty and things that I can use for my child. I don't have time to be reading labels all day. And those things work for her and they work for me. The same products I use on myself, I can use on her and it is A-OK. -okay. That is the highlight for me. Like we, I mean, she's only three and a half and she's a child that deals with eczema, but we can charcoal mask up together and she's not bothered. That is so cool. I'm just saying, like most right. masks probably have kids broke, broken out. Bro like, right. seriously. And so being able to bring that business model to the table, you know, with Beauty Counter, like being able to offer up something on the advocacy piece. And I always tell people maternal and infant health is my mission. It is my redirected life's purpose. But you can't talk about maternal and infant health if you aren't talking about women's and reproductive health and what we put on our bodies matter. And so I am so thankful that I decided to take this leap um, and do this work and really spread in a mission that is all the way to Capitol Hill and living in Washington DC metro area. I am all about this advocacy and policy and heal life. And I am just so grateful and beyond just the policy work to have a tribe and community like you ladies. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'll say for me, what took me down the entrepreneurial route were Megan, Morgan, Marissa, and Mariah. <laughs> Simply put, it was my girls wanting to create something um, that I could, one, model for them, for them to see entrepreneurship, and then also to be able to start thinking about 
how can I leave a legacy aside from my name? And, you know, how can I help them get a jump start on life and living out their dreams? Because let's be real, it takes money. And one thing that I think we as women of the African American community is just not we don't have that same leg up that some of our other counterparts have. And this opportunity with Beauty Counter gave me a way to try to maybe close that financial gap, but do it in a way that was meaningful and that had purpose. And like Erica said, something that was bigger than myself. And Jamel said it too, like we're not just selling products out of a box. Like we are selling a mission. We are selling a lifestyle. We are selling advocacy, like the whole nine. Mm -hmm. Educate, right. advocate. advocate. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so now, when you feel like, so as moms, it's, it's, it's a lot that we're having to deal with. Right. You know, Jamel and I, you know, we're staying at home, working from home. Um, you all are out in the workforce, you know, going to work and having to come back home and try to run a business and, you know, be um, mom as well. When you feel like and this this is directed to all of us, because even though, you know, Jamel and I may not necessarily leave the house on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, outside of what we need to do for beauty counter prior to COVID. Um, it's still, you know, we're having to be on pretty much 24-7 till we close our eyes. So when you all feel like you can't keep going, where do you find your inspiration? So for me, where I find my inspiration, quite frankly, is going back to my why, why I get up. Like today, I've literally, if I can be honest, I've been, I had one um, live event earlier today um, doing something similar on maternal health. Um, I had work full time today, um, all in the beauty of, of doing it at home. And I just got my second COVID vaccine. And so the waves of how I feel this week are quite interesting um but i know that it is bigger than me so that source comes from always a reminder that there is someone who needs to hear from me because it is less of me and more of god and i am just a vessel in this life's work and my daughter like when i like i i know it sounds so crazy and so like obsessive but when i hear her breathe at night y'all like that just does something something to me because we were not supposed to have that opportunity according to science alone. And when I think about it, and my husband will sit and like reminisce and think about it, we're like, man, this was not supposed to be according to, again, the scientific facts. And that keeps me going every single day. Even when I was at my worst going through postpartum anxiety and PTSD, I was just so incredibly grateful to have a motherhood experience that, frankly, I didn't even want. I was definitely a person as a first-generation college kid. I was like, I'm not trying to be responsible for somebody else's kid. I'm like, we were living paycheck to paycheck. I'm like, no, thank you. Right. And <laughs> to <laughs> no. exactly everything that Nicole said about, you know, Black families and Black women, we're, you know, the most educated uh, women out there, but we are always having to fight and hold the water for everyone else. But there is no one that is carrying the water for us. And I think that that is so important that when I get up, I rise to the day, even as, you know, exhausted as I am, when I feel like this work is calling me because I know it's not just about me. It's going to be about my daughter. It's going to be about your daughter. It's going to be about your daughter, you know, and your boys. And it it just goes on and on because we're already generations behind. And so closing that financial gap, exactly what Nicole said, that is also what speaks to me. And also not only closing the gap, but having um, financial literacy. Like I, that, Financial literacy personally freaks me out and it's not fun. It, it it stresses me out. I don't want to deal with it. And I'm like, I just automate everything. But my daughter, 
is already set up for a much more successful life than I personally couldn't even imagine. And for me, that is what gives me the fire and excitement to keep doing what I'm doing to save mamas and babies and particularly highlighting and saving our black mamas and babies because our mortality rate is out of control. Right, it definitely, it definitely is. Um, I would say similar to Erica, kind of what keeps me going is while she is, you know, talking about the, the gap in financial, the financial gap, the infant mortality gap, and I kind of look at the knowledge gap that we have mm -hmm. in the community um, and our environmental um, disparities. And along with that comes some of the things that Beauty Counter addresses in terms of safer products. Safer products are less available to our people. <laughs> and, you know, it matters. And we don't know how much that contributes to, like, Erica's wheelhouse of maternal fetal health, you know. So um, I just feel like to whom much is given, much is required. And I have a responsibility to share the knowledge that I've been fortunate enough to receive, um, you know, through my own life and personal education and also through the things that I've learned as a beauty counter consultant. And so that kind of keeps me putting myself out there and reaching out um, so that others can have the benefit of all the things that I've been given. Um, and I feel like we, we have to share that because everyone deserves, every single person deserves safe products. Everybody does. I plus one to all of that. And that is really why I do what I do. Uh, because one thing we can say is we are educators first in this business. Be and if you never bought a thing, you can't unlearn the information that we provided for you because it is factual. It right. is backed up with the, the statistics. It is known um, when you have the U.S. only having 30 toxic ingredients banned and no major legislative updates since 1938, that is a problem within itself. And when you have these same companies that are operating in the European Union and there are over 1400 chemicals and toxic ingredients that are either limited or banned, same for Canada, 600. And here in the US, we're just now at 30 because of Beauty Counter, because it was only 11 when Beauty Counter started. And yet our company, um, and mission is all about, we have a never list, 1800 ingredients that we will never use and counting. That says a lot. And, and if you're listening to this now or later, know that only 25% of products that are marketed to women of color are rated safe. Let that sink in. Right. And right. toxic chemicals and all these things, I just cannot overstate, it really impacts Things like having fibroids, uterine fibroids are big in the African-American community. Um, autoimmune disorders, um, infertility, you know, PCOS, um, cancer. Yes, all those things because what we put on our skin seeps into our bloodstream within 26 seconds. May have said it earlier, but I just cannot overstate that. And so thinking about our kids and... How do we get better? Like all these cancers that are coming up now, it's it's environmental, a lot of right. it. And we need to be more conscious of, about that. And we need to take back our community and say, no more. We're spending all this money as consumers, yet we aren't using our power and our dollars to tell these legislator, um, our representatives that we no longer want these toxic ingredients and we deserve better. And one by one, we are doing that as people of this amazing community of Beauty Counter. Right, right, right. And it's, 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 it's funny how, you know how they say it, you, you know they say it, uh, what you don't know won't hurt you. But in this case, what you don't know is hurting you. It has hurt us. And especially as, as moms, you know, we are the lifeline. You know, we bring, we help to, life comes through us, you know, to enter this world, right? And it's like, whatever is in our bodies, it gets transferred to our fetus, to our babies. And so they, they thought that the placenta would 
keep those toxins away from the babies, but they're showing that that's, that's not the case. That now they're showing that now toxins, those are getting transferred as well. Some of them get it excreted, but not all of them. And so when you know that, when you know that, especially having had a child be diagnosed with cancer, where cancer does not run in our family, like, no. And knowing that I've lived a pretty healthy lifestyle, we watched what we ate, you know, and all of that stuff. But I wasn't thinking about the products that I was using all over my body to smell good. You know, we're going on, get ready for the date. You know, this was before we got married, right? Get ready for the date. You know, you want to smell good with the perfume, smell good, lotion, and, you know, all that stuff. Had no earthly idea that legally, legally, those products have ingredients in it that that leads to cancer and it's like really really you know and i didn't know it until my daughter was born premature and that's when the doctor said be my the doctor be mindful of what you use on your body because it can hurt your premature baby and i'm like what? he said yeah what you put on your body can hurt the baby so you got to be careful so watch what you use and i'm like well if it can just hurt her just by her touching me what, what is it doing to the insides of my body you know and it's like we 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 have to be more proactive and when you have been a mom like in our situation nikki having had to go through hell and high water just to bring her babies here um erica having told that you're carrying a baby you're going to birth the baby, but the baby will not be alive. So we need to prepare for a funeral. But God said, not on his watch. But having gone through that, me having gone through, you know, trying, you know, having the baby, you know, not knowing if the baby's going to live, trying to, you know, all this, that, get here, food allergies, get here, pediatric, you go through all that. It's like, no, we're not standing for this. Things that we have control over, we want to control. And getting our Congress to pass better health laws is something that we can control because we got a mouth, we got fingers that we can call people and text, and we got money. And now in this climate, we've seen that money talks, right? So we have to continue to use our voices, you know, out there. When you see injustices, no matter what they are, you have to speak up for it. And like what Erica was saying earlier, as moms, when you see moms struggling, when you see moms going through stuff, reach out, help, support, lift each other up. Don't bash. You're like, oh, you just a stay at home, mom. You really don't understand. Oh, you, 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 you work outside the house. You know what I'm saying? We all got our journeys. We all have our walks. And we all are sisters in the struggle to be the best that we can be in providing the safest, most lovingest, most nurturing environment possible for our kids. Fully agree. Thanks so much, Janae. Um, I think, you know, we all probably have to go, but I would say definitely the last, the final thought I would like to leave everybody with is yes, find more community, build communities if you can't find one and advocate for yourself and your health. Um, learn more, reach out. To, if you need more information, reach out to any of us and continue to learn and grow and build communities because communities are how we're all going to make it and make it better. Yes, yes, yes. Any other closing remarks? I just say ditto. That was good. That was Y'all wrap, yes. <laughs> wrap that on up. Put and a nice pretty bow. bow. <laughs> exactly. No, just thank you so much for having us and sharing your platform with us tonight. Um, truly an incredible experience and really enjoy having you all as part of my amazing tribe as well. Yes, yes. And to everyone who tuned in live with us and to those who are uh, coming back later to watch it, I thank you. I hope that you have been inspired. I hope that you have been encouraged by Jamea's story as a stay-at-home mom. 
um, who is trying to find ways to be better and do better, um, who reached out because as a stay at home mom, you know, we still have work to do. We still have knowledge to share. And she found a way to do that through her beauty counter business to not only fulfill the need of having some type of, um, some type of aid in helping her family financially, but also helping um, the world, helping her kids, helping us, you know, live a better, healthier life from Erica, you know, with her story as a journey, uh, as a mom taking her journey as a professional, using that to help her family and using that to help everyone as a maternal, um, uh, maternal infant ambassador. And Nikki, you know, just, I'm just saying it's a lot of women out there who are dealing with infertility who may not feel comfortable in sharing. It's a lot. And just be encouraged by her story to know that you are not alone. You do not walk alone. And just look at us. Look at us. We're vibrant. We're happy. We're healthy. You know, we get through hell and back. Some of us may still be in there a little bit. Um, I, I, I deny it in the name of Jesus. But, um, just know that it's your choice whether or not you will let life take you under or you will stand up to it and say just like god said to um the doctors for nia not on my watch we have to say that when it comes to things that come against us not on our watch and as mom bosses we can do that and as you we deem you a mom boss as well. So get your cake and do what you need to do. And until next time, thank you, Jamel. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Nikki, for sharing this time with me and sharing your stories with everyone. I pray that they are a blessing to those who need to hear it. And until next time, please keep the dialogue going.